Today we're talking tips on working with models and whether you should invest in a camera body or a nice lens. Hey guys, and welcome to Flurn Q&A. My name is Aaron Nace, and you can find me on flurn.com. Each week, we're answering questions from you, our wonderful YouTube audience. So if you've got a question, just leave it in a comment right down below. And if we answer your question, well, you're gonna win a free month of Flurn Pro. Let's get into the questions. Hey Aaron, could you please explain the sharpening process of an image and resizing it for the web? This is a great question. Basically sharpening and exporting out for the web. There's a definite order here. Number one, you wanna make sure you're resizing your image first before you sharpen. Let's say you're gonna put this on your own personal website or on Facebook with a 1200 pixel wide image. So go ahead and size it at 1200 pixels and then do your sharpening for that size. Because if you sharpen a full size image and then shrink it down when you export it out for the web, that sharpening is gonna have a much different effect. When I want images to look really great on the web, First, I'll go ahead and resize them to the final size that are going to actually display, and then I apply my sharpening. An easy way to do this is to apply an export preset in Lightroom, where you can choose the final output size and the sharpening that it's gonna do after it resizes. Everything can be done for you completely in Lightroom. If you enjoy sharpening, you're gonna love sharpening. I want to invest in good equipment. Is it better to invest in a camera or a lens? What would you spend more money on? So here's the deal with cameras and lenses. Lenses are really pretty simple. They're a bunch of pieces of glass in a housing. You got a motor in there. It moves those glass around that allows you to focus your images. And they generally have a pretty good resale value, a long shelf life, and a good lens is going to be a good lens for probably the rest of your life. Until you die by being crushed by a pile of lenses. On the other side, cameras tend to be a lot more complex. And these days, most of what makes a camera go is the computer inside of that camera. And we all know that computers are advancing at a lightning pace. So chances are, if you get a great camera today, in a few years, that camera is going to be outdated. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be totally useless and you have to throw it away, but it might not have great ISO performance as compared with newer cameras of that day. And it may lack current features like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth capabilities. So if you're about to spend some money on a lens and camera combination, my advice would be to spend more on your lens than on your camera. And I would shoot for getting a lens that has a wide maximum aperture. Look at like a 50 millimeter 1.4 or an 85 millimeter 1.8. Those are gonna be great lenses. They're not incredibly expensive and they're gonna let a lot of light in that will make a big difference in your photos. That's gonna make a much bigger difference than spending a little bit more money on the camera body. And when you outgrow that original camera body, you can still use those great lenses with newer bodies. So out of everything that I use, my lenses pretty much stay the same and my cameras tend to rotate. I recently learned about actions in Photoshop. There's so much to learn. I wanna add sun rays to my photos. Would making an action be the correct way to keep a copy of this to use over and over again? I'm glad you're enjoying Photoshop. It's a fun program and you can do so much. And making actions is a really great way to do something over and over again. Now, when it comes to sun rays, you can definitely use a sun ray action that you've made over and over again, but you may find that there are gonna be subtle changes from image to image. We actually have a tutorial on how to create sun rays as well. You can click on your screen right now. So you can just do that. And if you'd like it, you can make an action out of that. How will a reflector improve my shots? And could you give me some tips on using one? So reflectors really are great. They come in a bunch of different sizes and have tons of uses for photography. Basically the idea is they're just shaping light. So whether you're bouncing light off a reflector, shining light through a reflector, whatever you're doing with it, basically the idea is making your light sources appear larger and more even. Now a common photography reflector is known as a five in one reflector. It's basically a round disc. In the middle, you have a translucent material that you can shine light through. And then you have a cover that you can zip around that and that's going to bounce light. So you have a black, a white, usually a silver and a gold. The black is gonna absorb some light, making more shadows. The white is gonna bounce a little bit of light. The silver side is gonna bounce a lot of light and the gold side is gonna bounce a lot of light with a gold tint. So if you're shooting outdoors during sunset and you wanna give the light even more of a warm look, you can use that gold tint to add that warm color. So if you've got a bright light right next to your subject, you can put the diffusion panel in between your subject and the light. That's going to make the light go through the diffusion and it's gonna create a soft light on your subject. If you're noticing your subject has dark shadows on their face, you can add a reflector to fill in those shadows. And don't forget, you can use multiple reflectors and diffusion together. Oftentimes during photo shoots, we're using three or four different reflectors or diffusion panels for different reasons. Keep in mind, the closer the reflector is to your subject, the more of an effect you're going to have. So if you really wanna cut light and make it soft and smooth, get that reflector right next to your subject. What's the difference between a layer mask and a vector mask? So to truly appreciate the difference between a layer mask and a vector mask, we have to know the difference between a raster-based image and a vector 
raster-based image. So a raster-based image, that's just pixels. So like tiny little squares, they're basically assigned different colors and that's what makes up your image. Now you'll notice if you take a raster-based image, which is like a JPEG and you make it really, really big, you're gonna lose a lot of quality because it's just taking those little squares of information and blowing them up. Now on the other side, we have a vector-based image and this is actually defined mathematically. So you can scale this infinitely larger and smaller and it won't lose information. So like think of a font as a vector-based image. So a regular layer mask is a raster based layer mask in which you're actually painting light and dark pixels on that layer mask. A vector mask is going to hide or show areas of your layer based on paths and you can create paths with the pen tool. If you just wanna paint light or dark on your layer mask, you can use a regular layer mask. If you want to define the visibility of your layer with a shape, like with the pen tool, then you wanna use a vector mask. Vector masks are commonly used for items like logos and icons, and regular layer masks are commonly used for photos. Hey Aaron, seeing all these amazing photos and videos on the internet can feel really overwhelming, not inspiration, because you feel you'll never get this good. What helps keep you inspired and motivated? We all have to start someplace, and in the beginning, we're never going to be as good as what we want, but if you know where you wanna go, then you're on the right track. And all you have to do is continue taking pictures or continue taking video and continue working. You're going to get better as you work, no matter if, if you're trying to get better or not, you will get better as long as you continue to push forward. Instead of looking at what everyone else is doing, you can look at your own work. Is the stuff you're doing this year better than the stuff you were doing last year? And if so, you're going in the right direction. You can probably look at older photos and be like, wow, I didn't really know what I was doing. I'm doing much better today. And as long as you continue on on that trend, then you will get to wherever you wanna be and everyone else is gonna look at you and say, man, I wish I was that good. And then you can serve to inspire those people. Hi Nace, do you direct models either partially or completely during a photo shoot? If yes, how do you direct? So working with models or people or basically anything that you're photographing really depends on the interaction between the subject and the photographer. If you're working with a person who knows what they're doing and feels comfortable in front of a camera and can move their bodies in a way that they feel comfortable and they have a little experience, usually I'm not directing them at all. Usually they know what they're doing and I'm just going to let them do their job. When I'm working with people who don't have as much experience in front of the camera or maybe aren't as comfortable, then I most definitely will help direct those people. And usually the things that I'm looking for are like primarily, I just want my subject to feel comfortable. And that has to do with your relationship with the subject. So don't think of this as like an inanimate object. Make sure you build a relationship with that subject and pay them attention during the photo shoot. Don't spend too much time in your camera. If they're uncomfortable during the photo shoot, that is going to show and that's going to ruin a photo shoot much more than whether their arm is over here or over here. The second thing I focus on is mood or attitude or theme of the photo shoot. Sometimes we're going like for a happy, fun, joyful image. Other times we're going for a little bit more somber. So we make sure to address that theme before we start shooting so both I and the subject know what they're actually shooting for. And number three, people don't always have to look directly into the camera and they don't always have to be smiling. You're oftentimes gonna get a lot more interesting pictures if people are looking slightly off center and maybe if they're making different expressions with their face. So if someone thinks they just gotta look right into the camera and smile all the time, you can say, hey, chill out. You don't even have to look over here. You can look over there. And oftentimes I'll have my subjects look in the direction of the main light source. It's gonna be a little bit more flattering on their face. And my last piece of advice for posing models is look for geometric shapes that are going to show off all their different body features. For instance, if I have my subject like with their arms straight out towards the camera, this all gets like kind of lost and jumbled where if they're doing something like this, it becomes a lot more clear because you can clearly see what's going on here with my arms. So this, as opposed to this, just apply that to their entire body and you should be fine. And it's really important to remember to have fun. Models are just people, so just treat them like regular people. Have a conversation with them. Like <laughs> That's what's going to make a fun photo shoot and the collaboration between you and the subjects, that's what's going to bring energy into the photo shoot. Last question. Last question. Last question. How do I do it in Spanish? Ultima pregunta. <laughs> Yo, Aaron, I'd like to learn more keyboard shortcuts. How important are shortcuts in your workflow? Keyboard shortcuts really do help speed things up and they're a huge part of my workflow. Basically anything that I can do with a keyboard shortcut in Photoshop, I'm going to learn that keyboard shortcut and use that every single time. It just saves a lot of time and you can do actions repeatedly 
very easily. If you want to find a list of all the available keyboard shortcuts in Photoshop, simply go to edit down to keyboard shortcuts and click on that summarize button. This will generate a document that has all the keyboard shortcuts listed out for you. And we actually made an episode that gives you five keyboard shortcuts to help you edit faster in Photoshop. Just click on your screen right now to see that episode. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Thank you so much to everyone who asked a question. And don't forget, if you got a question for me and the Flurn staff, just leave it in a comment right down below. Every single person who question I answer wins a free month of Flurn Pro. And if I answered your question, just follow the link in the description right down below. Send us a little contact on that form and we'll send you your coupon code for a free month of Flurn Pro. Thanks so much, guys. I'll Flurn you later. Bye, everyone. Pro tips from Aaron. <laughs> hey, nice. Cool. So, <laughs> if you're noticing, <sighs> today we're going <sighs> to... Or a nice lens. That one was good. There we go. I'm a professional now. See, one take. It's all it takes me.